welcome to today's episode of You and the Law. Congratulations to all Nigerians who trended and SARS, and protested against the excesses of the special anti-robbery squad. We congratulate you and hope that government keeps to its promise this time around. For emphasis, these protesters are not saying criminals should not be prosecuted, rather what they are saying is that, the Nigerian special anti-robbery squad should not assume that every young Nigerian is a criminal. Do not go about intimidating young people indiscriminately, because you suspect them to be criminals. Then, you go about asking them to pay money before you release them. That is absurd. Assuming that they are criminals in the right sense of it, should you ask them to pay money or prosecute them? What is the place of investigation in the operations of the police and the now banned SARS? There should be proper investigations before arresting a citizen. Isn't that the way it is done in other jurisdictions? There are several instances where the police failed to conduct adequate investigation before arraigning a suspect. However, we want to look at just one instance, the case of Prince Amica versus the state, 2013, Lupelver, 20,867, CA. While this is a true life story, all names mentioned in this video are fictitious. If you want to know the parties involved, please check the law reports. Thank you. On the 30th day of June 2005, at about 5.55 a.m., a woman was allegedly robbed at gunpoint. She was a food vendor along Zabayo Street, Benin City. According to her, she was washing the rice to be cooked when a young man approached her, held a gun to her face, took her 10,000 nair and her mobile handset. The man ran away thereafter. She immediately raised an alarm that attracted her neighbors, who pursued the robber until he was caught. The mob who arrested him took him to a Dian police station. Benin City. At the police station, he purportedly made a confessional statement wherein he stated that he usually conducts his robbery activities around the area. He was subsequently transferred to the office of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, popularly known as SARS, in Benin City. At SARS, he made another confessional statement also stating that he had been robbing in that same vicinity. The victim of the robbery, that is, the food vendor, made two statements detailing what happened. In the statement she made at the police station, she did not mention that the criminal was holding a gun. However, in the statement she made subsequently at SARS, she stated that the criminal was holding a gun. On the ninth day of June 2008, he was arraigned at the High Court of Justice, Edo State, holding at Benin City. He was tried on a single count of armed robbery contrary to Section 5B of the Robbery and Firearms Special Provision Act, 1990. Call the first case. Prince Amica vs. The State Charge number B-2C-2008 slash slash Accused person is in court, my lord. Any appearance? May it please my noble lord. I am Bassey West. My appearance is for the prosecution. Respectfully, my lord, I am Jude Johnson appearing for the accused person. Read the charge to the accused person. Prince Amica you are standing trial for armed robbery contrary to Section 5B of the Robbery and Firearms Special Provision Act, Cap 398 of the 1990 Laws of the Federation of Nigeria. Guilty or not guilty? I am not guilty. The accused pleads not guilty, my lord. Prosecution, call your witness. As the court pleases. Madam, please tell the court who you are. My name is Mrs. Evelyn Duco. I am a food vendor. I sell food to my customers here in Benin. Tell the court what happened on June 30, 2005. Thank you, sir. On that day, at about 5.55 a.m., I was washing the rice to cook when I noticed a man standing outside my shop. I ignored him believing he was waiting for someone. However, he entered my shop few minutes later, held a gun to my head, collected my 10,000 nera and my telephone. What happened thereafter? He ran away. I started screaming at the top of my voice shouting, Thief, thief. Other people who heard me shouting all came out. We started a pursuit and subsequently caught up with him. We took him to the police station. Did you recognize the criminal? Yes, sir. I was able to recognize him. He is the accused in court today. That will be all for the witness, my lord. Any cross-examination? As the court pleases. Madam, have you ever met the accused at any time before the incident? No sir, I have never met him. 
and he attacked you around 5.55 a.m. in the morning? Yes, sir. Somebody you have never met, attacked you that early in the morning, and you were able to recognize him? How many minutes did it take for neighbors to assemble and catch the supposed criminal? It took them 10 minutes, sir. When the mob caught the criminal, was he holding the phone and money that was stolen from your shop? No, sir. He was not holding it. What was he holding? He was holding a double barrel gun. How did you know that the person who attacked and stole from you was the same person the mob arrested? I just know that he is the one. That will be all, my lord. Please, call your next witness. As the court pleases. Witness, please tell the court your name and what you do for a living. I am Felix Daniel. I was part of the police team that arrested the accused person. What happened after his arrest? He volunteered a statement and was subsequently transferred to the office of the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, Benin. My lord, I apply to tender the confessional statement of the accused person. Objection, my lord. The accused did not make the statements voluntarily. The accused was tortured, coerced and forced to make the statement. The court conducted a trial within trial to ascertain whether the accused person voluntarily made the statement. After the trial, the court admitted the statement and evidence ruling that it was made voluntarily. That will be all, my lord. Any cross-examination counsel? Just a few questions, my lord. Officer, during your testimony, you stated that you and your men arrested the accused person. Am I correct? You are correct, sir. We arrested the accused person. You are sure that it was you and your men that arrested the accused person? Yes, sir. We arrested the accused person. Was he holding a gun when you arrested him? I do not remember that, sir. Was he holding any money or phone when you arrested him? No, sir. He was not. That will be all for this witness, my lord. Counsel, any other witness? Very well, my lord. Just one more witness. Please tell the court your name and what you do for a living. I am Kenneth Emanuel. I work with the SARS unit in Benin. Tell the court what you know about this case. The accused person was brought to our office by the police team in Adil. He made a statement in our office, admitting that he usually robbed in that area. I apply to tender the confessional statement as an exhibit, my lord. Objection, my lord. The accused person did not volunteer the statement. My lord, he was brutalized and beaten. He was forced to make the statement. The court conducted a trial within trial to determine whether the statement was voluntarily made. After the trial, the court ruled that the statement was made voluntarily and admitted the statement in evidence. That will be all for the witness, my lord. Counsel, do you have any cross-examination questions for this witness? As the court pleases. Officer, what was the condition of the accused person when he was brought to your unit? Was he beaten? No, sir. He was in a good shape, sir. Did your unit torture him? Did you beat him? Not at all, sir. Nothing like that happened. Do you have any idea of how a gun was found in the possession of the accused person? No, sir. I have no idea. Did he make the statement in the presence of a senior police officer? In this case, the OC SARS? I do not have that information, sir. That will be all for the witness. My lord, that is the case of the prosecution. I apply to close the prosecution's case. Mr. Jude Johnson, I hope you are ready to open your case. Call your witness. As the court pleases. Please tell the court who you are. I am Prince Emeka. Tell the court what happened on June 30th, 2005. Thank you, sir. On that day, very early in the morning, I was going to the park to know if I could see someone who will help me deliver a parcel to Port Harcourt when I heard people shouting thief. Thief. I stopped to know what the nest was all about and they held me saying that I am a thief. All my explanations to them that I am not a thief fell on deaf ears. They took me to the police station. What happened when you got to the police station? I was tortured. I was beaten. They wrote a statement and asked me to sign it. Can you read and write? Yes, sir. I am literate. I can read and write. That will be all for the witness. Any cross-examination? No, my lord. Any other witness? Yes, my lord. Please tell the court your name and who you are. My name is Mr. Okashikwa Opera. The accused is my son. Please tell the court. What you know about this case? I received a call on that fateful day, in the afternoon telling me to come to the police station that my son was there. 
By the time I got there, he was already brutalized. You needed to have seen the bruises on his body. My son is not an armed robber. He left the house that day to send a parcel to Port Harcourt. That will be all for the witness, my lord. Any cross-examination counsel? None, my lord. My lord, I apply to close the case of the defense. On the 23rd day of April, 2010, the court delivered its judgment. Admissibility is one thing, evaluation or the probative value put on the documents is another. From evidence led so far, I am convinced that in obtaining the confessional statements, there was no threat, torture, inducement or promise from anyone in authority. Having listened to the arguments and evidence before me, and following the confessional statements of the accused person, I find the accused guilty of armed robbery and sentence him to death by hanging. Dissatisfied with the judgment of the trial court, the accused appealed to the Court of Appeal. The issues before the Court of Appeal were, 1. Whether the prosecution proved the guilt of the appellant beyond reasonable doubt. 2. Whether the confessional statements are admissible against the appellant. Parties made their arguments thus. My lords, before an accused person will be convicted for an offense of armed robbery, the prosecution must prove the following ingredients. 1. That there was a robbery. 2. That it was armed robbery. 3. That the accused person was involved. My lord, the only evidence linking the appellant to the crime of armed robbery is the evidence of Mrs. Evelyn Dickup. My lord, from her evidence, it was clear that the appellant was caught by people who heard her shouting, Thief, thief that early in the morning. My lord, she did not state how she was able to identify the appellant in particular, as the person who pointed a gun to her head with one hand, and held her throat with the other hand. She did not testify as to the cloth he was wearing, or his features or what struck her about the appellant as the person who attacked her. My lord, in the well-celebrated case of Sunday and Didi versus the state, the Supreme Court warned on the need for the court, to be careful in convicting without proper identification in cases where the accused was not previously known to the witness. My lord, the Supreme Court stated that the court must meticulously consider the following issues. 1. Circumstances in which the eyewitness saw the suspect or defendant. 2. The length of time the witness saw the suspect or defendant. 3. The opportunity of close observation. 4. The previous contacts between the two parties. My lord, the statements made by Mrs. Evelyn Dicko at A.D. and police station is different from the statement made by her at the special anti-robbery squad, Benin. In the earlier statement, the witness did not mention that the appellant carried a gun, but mentioned the gun in the statement made at SARS. My lords, I submit that the trial court should have taken the evidence of Mrs. Dicko with a pinch of salt, and ought not to have convicted the appellant based on contradictory evidence. I refer my lords to Okunku versus the state where the court held that where the previous statement of a witness to the police and his evidence in court are conflicting. The proper approach for the court to adopt is to disregard both, for being of little or no probative value rather than picking or choosing which of them to believe. I also refer my lords to the evidence of Mrs. Dicko, where she stated that her money and handset were not recovered from the appellant. My lords, there was contradiction in the evidence of the prosecution witnesses. The evidence differed in relation to who first effected the arrest of the appellant. While Mrs. Dicko swore that the appellant was arrested by a crowd of people who came to her assistance, when she shouted for help, the police officer insisted that the appellant was arrested by police and T-Crime Patrol. My lords, where there are such contradictions and inconsistencies, and the evidence by a prosecution witness before a court, which cast doubt upon the guilt of the accused person, the doubt should be resolved in favor of the accused person, since the court could not choose and pick which evidence to believe. My lords, since the appellant was actually not arrested on the spot, the police should have conducted an identification parade. The evidence of Mrs. Dicko did not indicate how she came to recognize that the person arrested by the mob was her assailant. She did not explain whether she identified him by his clothing or his face or stature. A conviction for any crime may be based on a single confession, if voluntarily made. My lords, the fundamental ingredients of a confession is that it must be voluntary. Otherwise, it is deemed to be irrelevant and inadmissible. For a confessional statement to be relied upon, it must be direct, positive and unequivocal. My lords, where a confessional statement was neither direct nor positive, it is not admissible. A confession is admissible only if it is voluntary, 
and the onus of proving affirmatively beyond reasonable doubt that a confession is voluntary rests on the prosecution. In order to render a confession admissible, it must be perfectly voluntary and there is no doubt that any inducement in the nature of a promise or of a threat held out by a person in authority vitiates a confession. The appellant was tortured nearly to death before making the statements. I humbly urge my lords to reject the two statements submitted by the learned trial judge. The appellant claimed he could write his own statement himself but was not allowed to do so. The appellant's father gave evidence that the appellant had injuries on his body, which were not there before he was arrested. I pray your lordships, to upturn the decision of the trial court by allowing this appeal. Counsel for the prosecution made her own arguments thus. My lords, the prosecution successfully proved beyond reasonable doubt that Mrs. Dicko was robbed in 2005. We also established that the act was armed robbery. I refer my lords to the evidence on oath of the first witness where she stated that the accused put a gun to her head. My lord, the accused confessional statements further corroborates the evidence of the first witness, which was consistent with the identity of the accused, which was not in doubt to her as the one who robbed her. My lords, the witness also noticed the accused person before the robbery and in the course of the robbery, the accused came very close to her and held her throat, so there could not have been any doubt as to his identity. The best identification of an accused person my lords, is by the victim of the crime or the witness to a crime. There are no material contradictions in the evidence of the prosecution witness. The evidence of the appellant corroborates the evidence of the first witness. I urge my lords, to reject the arguments of the appellant with respect to the contradictions in the confessional statements. Since the statements were not an exhibit at the lower court, the appellant cannot through backdoor introduce it on appeal. The court is only bound by the evidence before it. The learned trial judge, having considered all the ingredients of armed robbery, and appraised the evidence before him, rightly held that the prosecution had proved its case beyond reasonable doubt. My lords. It is right law that where a trial court justifiably appraised the facts of a case, and arrives at a conclusion on the credible evidence, the appellate will not interfere with such finding of facts. I pray my lords to dismiss this appeal. After the arguments, the Court of Appeal delivered its judgment. The summary of the case of the appealant is that he did not make the statement voluntarily. The statement of the prosecution's star witness and other witnesses contradicted each other, and the fact that nobody could actually explain how the gun came to be with the appellant. The problem here is that the appellant's counsel should have tendered the contradictory statements before the court, and asked the witness to explain them in accordance with section 232 and section 233c of the Evidence Act. It is only when this is done that the court can consider it and decide if the inconsistency rule is applicable to it. Since the inconsistent statements made by the Mrs. Dicko were not admitted in evidence, the argument made by appellant's counsel cannot be considered since the conditions precedent for the applicability of the inconsistency rule does not apply. However, the contradictions in the evidence of the second and third witnesses regarding how he was arrested cannot be ignored. This is very important because, there seems to me to be a break in the chain of custody of the gun, which is the evidence of armed robbery. If indeed, the appellant was arrested on the spot as it were, how come neither phone nor money was recovered from him? How come only gun and cartridge was found? It is either you caught him with everything or you caught him with nothing. How did the gun surface? Who exactly first saw the appellant with a gun apart from Mrs. Dicko is of utmost importance, to the case of the prosecution. Who took custody of the gun when it was recovered from the appellant, and who handed same to the police? How come Mrs. Dicko? Not being a ballistic or gun expert know the kind of gun the appellant held to her head? I am not satisfied that the prosecution was able to establish an incorruptible chain of evidence in relation to this case. The very fact that there is contradiction as regards how he was arrested has made this a cloudy issue. Furthermore, the very circumstances of the arrest of the appellant give room for doubt. What was the particular feature of the appellant which made him recognizable? I am of the view that the circumstances of the arrest of the appellant and recovery of the gun and cartridge are suspect, and have raised doubt in my mind as to the guilt of the appellant. Such doubt must be resolved in favor of the appellant. I resolve the first issue in favor of the appellant. On whether the statements of the appellant were made voluntarily, 
It may be helpful to observe that during the two trials within trials held to decide on the admissibility of the two confessional statements, the appellant emphatically denied that the two statements were made voluntarily. After each trial within trial, the learned trial judge held that they were admissible. I have read the record and now am also convinced that in the first instance, the learned trial judge admission of the confessional statements was not proper. The statements were written by the police and SARS officials. They only asked him to sign despite the fact that he is literate. What puzzled me is that the statement filled out at the interior robbery squad was dated the 30th of June 2005, while the statement made by the appellant at AD and police station was dated the 31st of June 2005, a day later. It is obvious that the police got their stories wrong. The evidence before the court was that upon arrest, he was first taken to the police station. It was later that he was transferred to SARS. How then did the statement he made at SARS predate the statement he made at AD and police station? The father of the appellant confirmed the injuries on his son as a result of the beating he received from the police. What makes this of interest is the fact that, the police both at AD and at SARS insisted that he was not hurt in any way when he was brought to them. When an extrajudicial statement made by an accused was challenged as had been done in this case, on the ground that it was not voluntarily made, and a trial within trial had been conducted, the trial court must bear in mind that the onus is on the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the statement was voluntarily made by the accused. See Section 29.2 of the Evidence Act. I will reiterate what Lord Sumner said as far back as Ibrahim vs. R. 1914 AC 599 at 609. It has long been established as a positive rule of Nigeria criminal law and procedure that no statement by an accused is admissible in evidence against him unless it is shown by the prosecution to have been a voluntary statement in the sense that it has not been obtained from him either by fear of prejudice or hope of advantage exercised or held out by a person in authority. The principle is as old as hail. Thus, the onus is on the prosecution to establish beyond reasonable doubt that the statement in question had been made voluntarily. The statement made at the police station was not attested by a superior officer. The second statement made at SARS did not contain the name and rank of the superior officer who attested to it. In the circumstances, I am of the view that the prosecution did not prove beyond reasonable doubt that the appellant volunteered any of the confessional statements tendered in evidence against the appellant to warrant any weight being attached to the statements and the appellant being convicted on the basis of said statements. Ordinarily, it would go against the grain for an appellate court to set aside the findings of the trial judge. However, on a careful reading of the printed record, I am obliged to set aside the findings of the trial judge on the truthfulness of the prosecution witnesses. I must emphasize the fact that in spite of the prevalence of the offense of armed robbery, it would be a wrong attitude for the courts not to insist that the police ensure proper investigation and prosecution of criminal offenses. The police must be held to a high standard. It is better for ten guilty men to escape punishment where there is doubt as to their guilt, than for one innocent man to be convicted when there is doubt as to his guilt. The sanction here is capital punishment for the offense of armed robbery. I am now convinced that the prosecution proved that the appellant committed armed robbery beyond reasonable doubt. In the circumstances, I cannot affirm the judgment of the trial court delivered on the 23rd of April, 2010. I hereby set aside same. In its stead, I enter a verdict of not guilty and hereby discharge and acquit the appellant. Appeal allowed. Welcome back. Two things are takeaways from this case. One. The court can only act based on what is before it. At the trial court, the lawyer to the accused did not mention that the prosecution star witness made contradictory statements both at the police station and SARS. That was one of the reasons he did not succeed at the trial court. 2. Police must conduct their own investigations. I cannot emphasize that enough. Do your investigations properly. Nigerian police no doubt have distinguished officers who carry their duties professionally. However, it is trite that when a finger picks oil, it soils the whole hand. Please learn to do better. Have you subscribed to you and the law channel? Please subscribe. Let us interact in the comment section. Bye. See you soon.